If you have your Bibles there, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Per, 1 Peter chapter, uh, pardon me, chapter 4, chapter 4, and we're going to be in verses 12 through 19. Next week will be our Christmas message, and so next week I'm going to be leaning on you to, to uh, read and study 1 Peter 5, 1 through 7, and then we'll pick it up the week after that uh, and finish the year at the end of 1 Peter chapter 5, the last uh, 12, 14 verses, whatever's left there at the end. But next week, uh, Christmas message, just want you, I don't want you to miss this because we've been studying 1 Peter. I want you to study 1 Peter, read 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Uh, on your time, it'd be a good thing to be looking at. It talks about leadership within the church, and those are good verses. I don't want to miss those because I want to start our new study in the new year. We're going to follow up 1 Peter. We're going to go to 2 Peter. That's right. Yes. All right. So just so you know, that's where we're going. You can be reading ahead when you get some extra time. Would you stand with me as we read God's word? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. So be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian, for then the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. Verse 16, but it, it, it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. Praise God we can be called Christians. Amen. Verse 17, for the time has come for his judgment, and it must, be, it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So, if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right, and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. God will never fail you. Remember that as we talk about trials, suffering today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you for not ever failing me. And even though I've failed you many times, Lord, I know that you have never failed me. And I just can't say anything but thank you, Lord. I love you and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would take these words and in whatever way I've messed them up or whatever I've done that's not in your will, I pray that you just fix that, prepare that, deliver that in a way that you are pleased with. That every single person here, from the longtime member to our, our visitors, to those online, Lord, every single one of us would, would hear, myself included, would hear what you want to say to us today. Lord, we live in a broken world. We are broken people. And there's a lot of hurt. And there's a lot of suffering. In fact, Lord, there's some people here today that are hurting badly. And so I just pray that you'd really speak to their hearts today and encourage them with these words. Build them up and use us as tools that you would use to help build up each other. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When bad is good, does that make sense? Well, with God, it can make sense. When bad is good. Some people will ask questions like, um, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does suffering happen when you are trying to do what's right? It's an honest question. I, I, I tell people all the time, hey, 
Um, I don't have all those answers, but I know the one that does, and he's got big shoulders, and he can handle it. Take those questions to him. Amen? You, you realize it's okay to go to God and say, hey, I'm upset. I'm hurt. I'm angry. I'm, I'm bothered. I, I'm confused. I'm, I got news for you. He already knows anyway. Amen? And he's the right one to take it to. Every one of us, if you're not handling, if you're not hurting now, you're going to be hurting soon. And I hate to say it like that. I, I don't want to be a glass half empty kind of person. But, you know, that's, that's the reality of it. We are sinners living in a broken world that Satan runs. This is, this is Satan's land here. Amen? And, and so if you're not hurting now, you're heading into hurt. There, there, this is just a broken world full of broken people. And the question is not if it's going to happen. The question is when it happens, how are you going to handle it? As a Christian, how are you going to handle it when things go wrong? When, when suffering happens? When, when trials come up? You know, some people will say, look, you know, I accepted Christ and I expected those things to go away. Well, I don't know how else to say it other than you were wrong. I don't know how else to say it. You shouldn't have thought that. You were wrong. Um, because if, if you have an outline there, if not, it'll be on the screen for you. For those at home, uh, you'll get those. Listen, Christians are no different than anybody else. We are going to hurt just like other people hurt. We're going to suffer just like other people are going to suffer. We're going to go through problems, pains, trials, and, and I hate to tell you, some of those self-inflicted. Just like everyone else, we're going to go through problems. We're going to face loss. Some of you are facing that right now. We're going to face death. We're going to face disappointment, betrayal. Those who you thought you could depend on and you loved hurt you. You're going to face these things, lack of, you know, loyalty, those kind of things. You're going to face those things. And so Peter, speaking to those people who were going through some serious persecution for their beliefs, for their faith, basically says, guys, don't be surprised when it comes because it's coming. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you hurt because hurt's coming because you live in a hurtful world. And it's full of people who hurt. And sometimes it's us that do the hurting. Don't be surprised. Just, he says, be ready. Be ready. Be as prepared as you can be when things are going to hurt. Be prepared. Be ready to know at best, at best, because you don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? But at best, be ready to respond in a way that honors God during those trials. And I don't know about you, I tease with, with Frank all the time about this, um, I'm, I'm really good at responding if you give me about 48 hours, because I process slow. Frank, Frank thinks of things really quick on his feet, and I just look at him, and I say, I'm going to get you in two days, just hang on, all right? <laughs> He'll tease me and say something, and I say, in two days, I'm going to let you have it, okay? Hold on to that, don't forget you know, I'll tease him about that. I just process slowly. The best way I can prepare, the best way I can handle, pardon me, hard times is to prepare for them now and not wait until they hit and hope I respond correctly. Because I'm a sinner and I, and I can get hurt and I get my feelings hurt and I can be angry and I can, all the sinful things that everybody has, I have those same things. And if I don't prepare correctly ahead of time, boy, I'm going to really mess it up. And, and maybe you're there too. Maybe you handle it better, you know, on the fly. But, uh, you know, I think anything as a Christian, we should be as prepared as we can be. Not just for hard times, but even for prospering, for anything. We should be as prepared as we can be for what God's got in store for us. Whatever, whatever it is. Okay? 
It, it means being a good steward of whatever he's given us. Abilities, gifts, uh, you know, uh, things around us that we can use, people that we can, you know, tap into. And it, it means being a good steward of those things around us. And, and pre preparation for difficult times is one of those. Because they are coming, no question. There's no doubt. And so Peter, in these verses, as he's getting close to wrapping up this letter, says, okay, I want you to understand. I know you're going through some really hard times. They could literally lose their life at any moment for their belief in Christ. Right? We've talked about that throughout the study. At any moment, they could die. They could be killed, tortured, etc. for their trust in Christ. Right? And so he says, I want you to be ready. And he says, I, I got three things I want you to think about. Okay? I, want, I got three things I want you to think about. He says in verse 12, he says, number one, I want you not to be surprised when hard times come. I mean, how silly is it to be surprised when, when hard times come? When we know we live in, in a sinful world, and guys, this is not our home. So why would we think there's a reason why when they're playing a ball game, they have a home field advantage? Amen? Because you know, you know, if you're playing football and it's your home field, you know where not to step because there's that sprinkler. Amen? You know not to run a play to that side of the field because the sprinkler stuck on last week and it's a marsh. We're hoping to see them covered with mud, not us. You know, those kind of things. It's a home field advantage. Satan has the home field advantage. This is not our home. But the power that's in us is greater than the power in the world. So don't be surprised when these things happen. Okay? There's no way to live in this world without bad things happening. I, I don't know what you think you're going to be. You can go hide in a closet. They used to say hide under a rock. You ever heard that expression? I always wondered, if you hide under a rock, the rock's going to kill you. So it's going to crush you. So I, I never understood that expression. But you can go hide in a closet. Say, okay, I'm going to try to keep myself from problems. And all by yourself in the closet, you will find problems. Amen? I mean, I, I, I'm in a sinful body. I don't need your help to sin. I find plenty of ways to sin all by myself. Thank you very much. And I'm sure you're the same way. See, so they're going to come. There's no way to live in this life. And I don't think Christ, in fact, I know Christ doesn't want us to go hide in a closet. He didn't say, hide your light. He said, don't hide your light. He said, be an example. Be someone that can be seen. So there's no way to live in this life without bad things happening. We don't belong here. You know, it's like going to a foreign country. Um, you, better, you better learn some of the customs before you do something that's going to get yourself in trouble. Amen? Before you, before you take a trip to London and you jump in a car, in a rental car, and, and drive on the right side of the road, you better figure out the rules and figure out you're on the wrong side of the road, which is the left side, which is not the right side. Ours is the right side, which, but you know what I mean. So figure out the rules, understand where you're at. This is not our home, but even the people here, the non-Christians, the people that don't have Christ, they're going to experience pain. They're going to experience loss. They're going to be struggling. So if they're going to struggle, the people who have the home field advantage, the non-Christians, how much more are we going to be struggling? Because we, we don't want to live the way that this world wants to live. So you just expect it that these things are going to happen. But you say, well, but pastor, that's why I got saved. I mean, I'm saved. I shouldn't have these problems. Yeah. Okay. Jesus never sinned. Amen? And yet Jesus faced problems his whole short life and was killed at 33 years old. Now, if Jesus lived a perfect life and was, was you know, faced 
problems every day, including people chasing him down to kill him, who finally succeeded for a little while. He lives today. Okay, so just want to make sure I make that point. If Jesus faced that, and then I, who screw things up every other day, am living in the same world, I, I know I'm going to face problems. Amen? Because when the world's not causing me problems, I'm causing my own problems. And it's the same for you. This world is broken. So expect that you're going to get hurt. People are going to hurt you. Christ calls us to love others. Amen? There is just no way to do that without putting yourself out there where you're going to get hurt. There's just no way to do it. You are going to get hurt. Jesus got hurt for loving others. You are going to get hurt for loving others. It's just going to happen. And it's not an excuse to stop doing what Jesus asked you to do, what, to, what he told you to do. You got to keep loving others. You just got to know you're going to get hurt, period. It's going to happen. Now, here are a couple of ways to respond when those bad times come, knowing that, you know, you're, you, want, you try not to be surprised, okay? Here, number one. When these things happen, this is a way of being prepared, not being surprised. Remember this. When the bad things happen, remind yourself, okay, bad thing happened. And number one, that means I got to remember God hasn't forgotten me. People will desert you. They will. Sometimes the very people you help the most will turn on you First, Jesus will never leave you. Ever. Boy, that was a good amen, but I'm telling you right now, that is something to thank God for. Amen? Wow. He hasn't forgotten you. He will never stop loving you. Ever. As long as you know these things will happen... You don't have to be taken by surprise. And when they happen, you could just say, you know what? Okay, that's a bad thing. That's true. This, I wish this hadn't happened, whether I caused it or someone else caused it. But you know what? God hasn't forgotten me. He hasn't given up on me. He is still here, even when I cause it. Amen? I remember going to my parents a couple times when I would screw up, when I'd mess up. And my dad would look at me and say, uh, no, no. He, he watched Happy Days. He'd call me bucko. No way, bucko. You got yourself into this mess, you're going to pay for it. And I'm glad he did. I'm not complaining. Amen? I learned lessons. And in the, really, he hadn't left me. He wasn't leaving me. He was letting me take what I deserved. But man, and Jesus will let us, and he will let you take your lumps for what you've done, but he will never leave you. He will always be there. So don't forget that. Don't be surprised when it happens, and immediately remind yourself, he hasn't forgotten me. Number two, when these things happen, use them as an opportunity to say, okay, let's see, what part did I play in this? Learn from it. If you know they're coming, then you can be better prepared to learn from it when it happens. Amen? Coach Tyler coaches a football game. And the guys get beat 42 to nothing. I'm, I'm making this up. It's a pretend game. And he gets beat 42 to nothing. As much as the, 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 the human side of him is like, I want to take that game film and burn it. I want to take it and stomp on it. I want to take it and make it so I never see it again. The football coach in him says, I have to watch it because I have to see what we could have done better. It's not fun. Trust me, I've been in a film room where there was a coach. Um, let's see, how do I say this? Using some special adjectives to describe my effort. This close. 
not a Christian coach, not here, okay, right here, using some special ways to describe how I performed on that play. But the point was, learn from it, dummy, so you don't do it again. I wish he had used dummy. That would have been nice. But anyways, yeah. You got to have the right attitude. You got to know going in, I'm going to mess up. Bad things are going to happen. So rather than just whine and complain about them, let me look at it honestly and say, what can I learn from this? What could I have done better? Even if it's 100% the other person's fault, you want to look at it and say, okay, how could I have been better prepared? Uh, how could I maybe have seen this? How can I maybe next time see this coming? Or how can I show God's love better when I get hurt like this again. Maybe you don't like the way you responded, and so you get better, and you get ready next time. Say, okay, the next time I'm, you know, messed up like this or hurt like this, I'm going to respond better so I look more like Jesus. Get ready. Say, what can I do better next time? Learn from it. What kind of waste is it when something bad happens to you and, and you don't learn anything from it? I mean, that's a waste. You need to learn from it and get better. Amen? Okay, that's weird. That's weak, but okay, we'll move on. <laughs> Lastly, number three, another way of getting ready and preparing yourself and not being surprised, responding when these things happen, is saying, listen, if people are going to ridicule you for being a Christian, if people are going to ridicule you for doing what's right, when it happens, let's say they get on you because you decide to... Um, be truthful or honest and it costs you money or it costs you a position or it costs you a promotion or it costs you whatever, then just consider that a privilege because that's exactly what happened to Jesus. He spoke the truth, amen, and he was hung on a cross. Somebody, somebody decides to not give you the promotion because you are honest, you know what? I may never look more like Jesus than right now. I'll be honest and give up that promotion because I'm going to do what's right. Amen? Consider that a privilege. People want to make fun of you or say something negative about you because you, you go to church on Sunday instead of going wherever else. California is full of places to go on, on Sundays. Amen? They want to say something about that. Don't, guys, don't. We were just talking about Abraham in Sunday school. Don't pull an Abraham, okay? Don't, don't, when they say, why don't you go, and then you don't say anything, because you, you don't want to say church, and you think, well, I didn't say anything, so I, I kind of, be honest, be open, be transparent. I'll tell you why I didn't go to the ball game, because I went to church. Say it. Don't be gutless. That's not a Bible word, that's a Lincoln word. Say it. Amen? Say it. I'm not saying be ugly about it. Don't be obnoxious about it. I think about when times like that happen. I think about when Jesus was going through all those uh, trials. Remember before he was crucified? Sometimes he spoke up. Sometimes he remained silent. Rely on the Holy Spirit to know when you should say something and when you should just, just be quiet. That, that's, a, that's a talent some of us need to learn better. When to be quiet. To tell I need to learn when to be quiet. And some of you are there with me. So, don't be surprised. Know Christ hasn't forgotten about you. Know that, you know what, even if I think the other person is totally to, at fault, I still played a part in this. What part did I play? How can I be better prepared next time? And consider it a privilege when you have to go through some of this stuff in Jesus' name. Amen? It's all part of being prepared. Now, Number two, in verses 13 and 14, he says, okay, now, when these hard times come, rejoice. Now, I just paused to make sure nobody got up and left. All right, good. All right, you're sticking with me. I appreciate that. Because it is human nature to hear, uh, wait, what? Hard times come, so I'm supposed to rejoice. Okay, well, as usual, don't let Satan or yourself, don't blame everything on Satan, sometimes it's us, uh, take verses and misapply, misinterpret, or just 
misunderstand them. Okay? Don't celebrate because you got bad times. Celebrate because you get to go through those bad times with Jesus by your side. Amen? He's not asking Peter in this point, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter, is not asking us to somehow um, be like supernatural or not human and be glad that we got bad news. That's not it at all. I, I heard it said, and it was a long time ago, that a Christian should never cry at a funeral because that shows a lack of faith. And it was a person that was much older than me, so I was not in a position, I was not raised when I could say something. But I wanted to tell them to shut their trap. Now, like the rest of my life, I'm, I'm in fear that my father's going to come around the corner at any moment and catch me doing something wrong, even though he you know, never sees me. So, But still, that's just not right. You understand what I'm saying, people? D don't, don't listen to that junk. Okay? Rejoice because, number one, you have rewards waiting for you in heaven. You realize this is not our home. And it's okay. I know some Christians are a little uncomfortable about this. But listen, if it's in the Bible, it's okay to talk about we have rewards waiting for us in heaven. Now, I'm not saying that's why you go out and do everything because, you know, we're motivated out of love for Jesus, but it's okay to say, and hey, guess what? If I do a good job, I have rewards waiting for me in heaven. And I don't understand all of that. And there's some disagreement amongst some Christians about what that's going to look like and crowns and jewels and throwing them at feet and what we have and where you're going to live and you're going to live uptown, downtown. I don't care. I know I'm going to heaven. And I know that God is in heaven and I'm going to be with him for eternity. And, and so I know that I have rewards waiting in heaven. Try to view, and this is hard, but this is part of Christian maturity. When hard times come, try to see them the way Christ sees them. Try not to look at them the way you do. Try to see them in light of eternity. Everything we do should be remembering, uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis that used to call it uh, a, a, the eternal perspective. Okay, so you have a trouble with your boss, think of it as an eternal perspective. Think of it in terms of it, an eternal perspective. How does this affect, it's not going to change where you're going to heaven, but how does God care about this? View this in light of Christ. Look through it through his eyes. Try to see it in his eyes. Someone wrongs you. How would Christ want you to respond? Not the way you want to respond, because we want to, you know, we want to get back at him. I, I, you know, eternal perspective. Try to remember that our suffering here on earth has a direct correlation to the riches that we're going to receive in heaven. Understand, I, I don't understand all of that, but I understand this. He's going to reward me in some way in heaven. And my little tiny pea brain, little human, tiny little perspective you know, only understands kind of like rewards the way we do. And God has this, you know, he's just infinite. And I'm very not infinite. I'm very finite. And so I just accept that there's something there waiting for me that's so awesome I can't understand it and I can't wait to be there. Amen? Try to view that. Now, I'm not telling you I'm always good at that. Boy, sometimes problems come and it gets me down, gets me discouraged, gets me mad, gets me whatever. Try to view those things in light of God. His, we used to say, taking some old teacher's classes, and they used to say, you know, try to look at it through the, the lens, the, the colored lens of someone else. Like, you, you, like putting on someone else's glasses. You ever tried to put on someone else's glasses? And they're like Mr. Magoo. Any of you remember? Any of you old enough? Those who are not old enough, you can YouTube it later. Not now. Later. And you put them on, you're like, whoa. Almost makes you fall over. You know, look at it through someone else's perspective. Amen? S try to see it in terms of how God looks at it. Christ was dying on the cross in between two people that represent a lot. 
One that's like, you know, totally rejects and doesn't care and doesn't want and ends up in hell. And one on the other side who humbles himself and accepts. And guess what? He died for both. He still died for that one that was rejecting him and basically just kind of spitting on him, so to speak. Like he was just rejecting him. And Jesus died for him. You know what? I, I think sometimes as Christians, we, we, just, we just want to complain about what we have to face. And if we just think a bit about, about how much Jesus faced, we'd realize it ain't that bad. Look at it in terms of eternity. Look at it in terms of how he sees it. And then also in verse 14, this is awesome. And I guess growing up in a Baptist church where you're just constantly concerned about, you know, you don't want to get too, well, you know, whatever. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to go over here. I don't want to go over here. I don't want to get... We don't, we don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. And he talks about the Spirit of glory. Remember that? I can't help but think. Remember in the Old Testament... Israelites wandering around 40 years, wilderness. Remember that story? It's okay to say yes. Okay. All right. And remember they had the Shekinah glory. In the day, they had that cloud. At night, they had that fiery kind of cloud, you know. And they were following it, and that cloud represented to them, it displayed God's presence. Right? This is pre-Holy Spirit. This is pre-Pentecost. Pre the book of Acts. Remember, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. That represented God. They, all they had to do, instead of looking down and complaining about their food or water or whatever else they were complaining about that day, or complaining about their shoes that didn't wear out for 40 years, <laughs> amen? Yeah. Nike ain't got nothing on the Israelite shoes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but instead of looking, all they had to do is look up and say, oh, that's right. God is with me all the time. Now, you and I have it even... I know you think of that and you think, oh, that would be awesome to look up and say, oh, there's God's fiery cloud. I guess I got news for you. That doesn't even compare to what you have today. Because instead of God being up here somewhere, I'm kind of picturing that in my mind. I don't know how you picture that like, you know, right above me. You, when you accept Christ, have the Holy Spirit live inside of you. So you can kind of, this is how my brain works. Hold on, this is scary. It's like reaching up there. This not happened. I'm just telling you how my brain works. This is not biblical. Okay? It's like going, reaching up there and saying, oh, fiery cloud. Ah, get, it's right inside of me. I get Christ inside of me. When you accept Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Do you understand how awesome that is? Yes or no? I don't think you do. You have the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. Why would I let a trial worry me cause me ulcers or upset stomach or fear or worry or concern. Why would I let that happen when the God who put the mountains over there and then put some snow on top to make it really pretty, that's how powerful your God is. Did you notice him today? Beautiful. That was nothing to what he is doing in your life. You say, oh, beautiful. We have the ocean, California. We have the oceans. We have the mountains. And we have uh, whatever else. We have all this other beauty. We have Pastor Frank. He's beautiful. We have all this beautiful. We have all this beauty. Yesterday was the birthday boy. I got to make sure I call him beauty because he was birthday yesterday. He's, he's 78 years old now. <laughs> um. You have all this beauty, and yet none of that compares to what he's doing in your life. And yet I'm going to fear and worry about someone making fun of me because I decided to go to church, or, or someone, you know, betraying me. You know what? I don't want to say who cares, because we need to care about people. I don't want to say who cares. 
but someone betrayed me. Jesus never leaves me. I mean, that's our perspective. That's what we need to have. And I know you say that up here, but, you know, symbolically, do you really live it and feel it and, you know, because you'll say, I know Christ never leaves me, and then we'll turn right around and worry and complain and fear about something. God is in control. I'll go back to what I said before. If you're still feeling fear, having said that, and you say you believe that he's in control, you need to go back up to point one, number, part one, number two, or B. I think I changed them to letters on yours. Mine's a little different. I think it's B. The second one, and say, okay, but now what part am I playing in this? Because you may still be finding some fear because you know Christ is with you, but you haven't done everything that the Holy Spirit's called you to do, caused you to, called you to do in that situation, so therefore... You are still feeling some fear because you're not following God completely in the midst of that trial. Whew. You get it? Hopefully that makes sense. You ever, you ever seen someone face something and you're like, wow, that is horrible. That, and they're just, they are just as cool as the other side of the pillow. I stole that. I didn't make that one up. <laughs> they're just as calm as can be. And you're like, wow, where does that come from? Well, if they have the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you where it comes from, the Holy Spirit. It comes from Jesus, and it comes from knowing that they've done everything they can. And so whatever happens after that happens, but they have a conscience that is clear, and whatever happens happens because they know God is in control. So a Christian who is still feeling fear and concern and worry, etc., you need to ask yourself, back up to 1.2 there, uh, what more should I be doing? Face it with that eternal perspective. Know that you have the Holy Spirit in you. That, it's, like that, it's like that cloud was a visual to say, don't forget, guys, even though you messed up, don't forget that part of the story. They messed up. They sinned. That's why they are wandering for 40 years. Should have been about a three to six month trip. Okay? Okay. You think Gilligan's Island was bad. It's supposed to be a three-hour tour. It's supposed to be a three- to six-month thing. It turned into 40 years. Because of their sin. And yet, what does Christ do? You sinned. I'm going to punish you. But guess what? I'm going to do something I've never done before. And I'm going, well, yeah, never done before. I'm going to put a cloud here every day. It's going to follow you around. I mean, I can't, we can't make this stuff up. Only God can do this stuff. It's amazing. I found this in one of my commentaries. I really like this. The glory of the indwelling spirit. Okay, now the indwelling. God, the Holy Spirit coming in. Amen? The glory of the indwelling spirit ought to be seen now we're talking to, this, this person is talking about, this author is talking about how we should act during difficult trials. And what other people see in us when they watch us go through these trials. You with me? He says, the glory of the indwelling spirit ought to be seen by everyone with whom we come into contact. They ought to see... Something just barely short of a cloud of fire or, you know, cloud around your life. They ought to see something in your life during the trial that says there's something different about that person. And they may not be able to put their finger on it. They may not be able to identify it. But they, they need to see that there's something different in you by the way you respond to hard times. Hey, listen, things are going great. They expect you to be happy and things go great and be, you know, happy-go-lucky and singing Christmas carols and drinking cocoa, right? Uh, when things go bad, now they're going to watch. All right, now let's see. All this Christian stuff, is it real or is it going to fly out the window at the first sign of, you know, trouble? Amen? Now you can make an impact. You say you want to make an impact for Christ, amen? Don't we all say, I would love to lead people to Jesus? Oh, yeah. I'm going to try it again, because sometimes you just need a second chance. <laughs> we all say that we want to lead people to Jesus. 
Amen? Okay, so if the best way to do that is by allowing trials, because notice I said allowing, God doesn't cause sin, but he allows them to happen and then walk side by side with us through those trials, then uh, you know what? We ought to be thankful those have come because we have the opportunity to shine for him. Not happy that they happened, happy that we get to have him and make an, an impression on others. There's a difference. Okay? There's a difference. The glory of the indwelling spirit ought to be seen by everyone with whom we come into contact. He shines forth brightly and unmistakably when we rejoice in the midst of suffering. So someone says to you, man, I've been praying. I know you've been going through a hard time. You say, thank you. I, I appreciate those prayers. It's tough, but I'll tell you what. I got Jesus. I'm not asking you to, to get rid of the tears. That's, that, that's not even godly. That's not even, that's not even correct. I'm not asking you to stop crying. I'm not asking you to stop hurting. You are human. You are broken. I understand that. We're, we're all going to hurt. But here's the thing. You know, through those tears, tell people, but I have Jesus. I have Jesus. You lost a loved one. I get it. I know that hurts. But you know what? I'm asking you to tell people, yes, it hurts, but Jesus is in control. And I, I don't know what he's doing, but you know what? He's not done with me. And I'm going to keep hanging on, even though I don't know what tomorrow holds. But like the old song says, I can still face tomorrow because I know he's going to be with me tomorrow just like he is today. I'm not asking you to have all the answers. I'm just ask, asking you to make sure you tell them, Jesus has not left me while it has been happening. Last, he says in the last like four verses, 15, 16, 17, 18, nine, five verses. Okay, last five verses, 15 through 19. He basically says, okay, now guys, now that you are not surprised by it's going to happen, and now that you've been told to rejoice while it happens, now commit yourself completely to God. Now that word commit, we have some words that we misuse or underappreciate. Like, you know, I will say I love hamburgers. We misuse the word love there. Right? I mean, hamburgers, in my humble estimation, are straight from God, but I should not be using the word love there. Okay? Even if it comes from in and out, still. Okay? But commit is a word that we don't, we don't get the full impact. Commit means to make a, an agreement, a promise, it is a bond that can not be broken. So I want to commit now to doing what God wants me to do because the hard times will come later. And once the hard times come, it's harder to commit then. You want to commit first, right? I've done over a hundred weddings. And I always know that tough times are coming because Satan, Satan does not want the Christian ideal of marriage to happen. He wants to fight and break up the, the Christian marriage, the Christian family. Okay? But I've done over 100 weddings, and, and they're always looking at each other, smiling, you know, loving, tears. It's all lovey-dovey. We got 1 Corinthians 13. We got, you know... Somebody singing some sappy song on the other side. Everybody is happy. Everything is wonderful. Everything is great. They're making the commitment then, knowing that the hard times are coming later. Because they're going to come. We're humans. We're going to disagree. Tough times are going to come. Marriage is not hard. It's not easy. It's hard. Loving someone unconditionally is tough. Amen? It's tough. But I've never seen a wedding that started off with, hey, let's do the vows while we're arguing. <laughs> Not how it works. You want to commit now so that when the tough times come, you say, I know this is tough, but what I have in this marriage can last. It's better than these tough times. It's bigger than these tough times. And what we have, and that's, that's the picture of our relationship to Christ, right? A picture of it. 
what we have in Christ is bigger than what happens to us in this world. Now, I want to make sure that you hear me out. There's a couple things I want to say here before we close. One of which is a review of what we already said, and one is, is, something, is something new here. As a Christian, I am not promising you that if you just hang on, that the bad things that are happening are going to go away. Not in this life. So if you get bad news from the doctor tomorrow, which can happen, amen? I'm not telling you that if you just try to respond like Peter said, eventually uh, there's going to be a cure and it's just going to go away. It may be the thing that ends up sending you to heaven. It may be. But I can tell you this, it's temporary. And so if you think of it, again, in terms of eternity, it's pretty minor it's pretty short. Amen? And again, it's hard for us to understand. I don't know if you're like me. My, my brain, remember the old pinball machines? When you got a little too aggressive and it would go on tilt? I know, none of you did that. Only me. Okay. All right. Let's just say only I saw it go on tilt. Yeah, right. Uh, when I start thinking about eternity, my brain just kind of like tilts. Like, I, I don't get it. You know what I'm saying? It's just one of those things that blows my, my brain up. I just, whoa, explodes. Um, our, the more you think of things in terms of eternity, our, our, our problems in this life, even if they last for the rest of, of your life, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that, that's something to think about. And no, I'm not promising you. You say, I'm really hurting right now. I've never been hurt as much as some of you have been hurt. I, I can't say that I have. Some of you have gone through kind of pain I've not had to go through, at least yet in my life. But I, I know for a fact in talking and learning and listening to some of you, the pain doesn't go away of those things. You learn how to accept it, move on, live, and, you know, trust Christ through that. But we're still people and we still miss those we've lost, etc., Right? But the more we realize that we have eternity with Christ, the smaller and smaller that should get. And I'm not saying it doesn't hurt as much. It just means that when comparing God to things, everything seems small. So commit yourself. You know, you've seen those, those uh, mugs or T-shirts and it says, you know, what is it, stay calm, drink tea? Stay calm. Watch the ball game. Is that what stay calm or be calm? Whichever one is. Stay calm. Stay calm. You know, take a nap. Whatever. I don't, I've seen a hundred of them, right? Listen, stay calm because God's in control. I didn't say don't hurt or, or pretend it doesn't hurt or stop hurting. I didn't say that. I just said remain calm because our God is in control control. Be calm. Trust that he is in charge. He can handle whatever it is you're facing. He's seen it all. He's bigger than it all. Amen? In fact, one day he looked at a graveside and said, um, hey, Lazarus, get out of here. And I, I'm under the impression, I got this from Max Licato, the, the author and artist and everything. God just gave him all the talent in the world. Um, but I, I'm under the impression that if, if Jesus hadn't said, uh, Lazarus, if he had just said, hey, get out of, come out of there. Boy, there have been people coming up out of that grave. Jesus was like, I know my power. I got to say Lazarus or every dead person that ever walked because that's how powerful your God is. I may be wrong. But man, that's how powerful your God is. That's how awesome your God is. Stay calm. When you respond poorly to difficult times and you suffer for the way you reacted... Also, remember this. Go back to that other thought. Remember, 
Um, <clears throat> don't look at that like that's part of the persecution. If, if you, and I just think this is a tough, this is a tough pill to swallow, but you gotta, you gotta swallow it. When tough times come, okay, something that you did not cause yourself, and then you respond in a sinful way to it, okay, and then you are paying the price of the way you responded in sin, don't look at the price you're paying as part of the, of the hurt that was caused by the suffering. No, you caused that suffering. You with me? I, I want you to hear that. Because at the end of the day, I wouldn't love you if I didn't say, you've got to obey God or you're going to suffer the consequences. Our God is just God. He's a loving God. When you do what's wrong, you will pay for it. And you can't use, well, this horrible thing happened to me as an, an, as a, an excuse to do something that's wrong. Then you're going to pay for that. And don't look at that, what you're paying for, as part of your, you know, the suffering that happened that you didn't deserve. Uh, listen, I, at the end of the day, we're all sinners. We all deserve, we deserve hell. We're all sinners. But Christ died for us. So, I mean, you know, whatever happens to us, we deserve because we're sinners. We've broken God's laws, what he's called us to do. And, and you know, we don't deserve heaven. You and I don't deserve salvation. It's given to us as a free gift. Free to us, not free to Jesus. So just know that, um, you know, you got to be honest with yourself. I mean, sometimes you're going to pay for some bad choices. So that's why you got to go back to this lesson, to this sermon, and say, I got to prepare. I got to get ready so that when these things happen, I don't make things worse on myself. I handle it in a way that is the best that I can and hopefully is a, is a good represent, representation of Christ so that I can lead other peoples to Him. Amen? As the musicians come, the question then is, how do you handle difficult times? How do you handle difficult times? Because if they're not happening to you, some of you are facing difficult times right now. I bet you there's some people sitting here today to think, Lincoln made this sermon with my name on that paper he's looking at. Okay? You want to look at it afterwards, I will show you. Your name is not on this sermon. Okay? Let me make sure. I don't have any names on here. I see God a couple times. Yep. No names. Not you. You're living through some of these things right now. Whether you caused it yourself or whether it came because it's a sinful world and it's part of being in a sinful world. How do you handle difficult times? I, again, sometimes I say things and I want to make sure I preface it so I don't sound mean or rough. Some of us are going through hard times right now and we're not handling them the way God would want us to handle them. And I don't say that because I want to be self-righteous and, and say I always do because I mess up doing that too. I, I understand exactly. I'm right there with you. But I couldn't say I love you if I didn't tell you that because I think some, there's probably someone here that needs to hear that. Again, medicine doesn't always taste good, right? Sometimes, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's good for us, but it's not exactly what we want to swallow. Not, we're not all handling these things good, but you can make a decision right now to start handling them in a more godly way. You can do that right now. You can yield your pride. You can give up your, your arrogance or your whatever, and you can give that to Jesus and say, Lord, teach me through this this, this time, this trial. You can do it. You got to yield. You got to give up. You got to let God have his way. Do you really trust God? If I said you trust God, I'd get a bunch of amens. I mean, do you really trust God? 
Do you trust God to kind of trust like where you would take your firstborn son and get ready to sacrifice him if he told you to? Remember that one? Like, do you trust God that much? Do you trust God 100%? Not when it's easy. Not when things are going well. Do you trust God when your life can be on the line? When your reputation can be on the line? When your paycheck, your pay raise, your reputation, your day off, whatever it is that you think you've got to give up, trust God in spite of whatever's happening. Do you really trust him? Maybe you're facing something right now and you're responding poorly. And, and you think of it in terms of a, you know, some old Christmas lights on the outside of the house. Some of those lights just kind of start getting a little dim, don't they? Start kind of dimming. That's, that's a Christian who's just not trusting God like they should in tough times. And they're not lighting a whole lot of people's lives. But you trust God in the, in the midst of a trial and it's like a, it, it, it's, you know, it's like LED lights bright and shining for everyone to see. That's the question. Do you trust him? The hard times are coming or the hard times are here. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? As they sing.